Hello, hello. Uh, here's another update. Um, it's funny, when I do these videos, I always try to remember where I left off, and I just, I never can. I think the last video I shot, um, I had gotten home from LA. Because I remember that being a watershed moment as far as the effect of altitude and all of that. <clears throat> so I don't know if you can see in the background, it's been dumping rain all day long. It's 45 degrees for the end of October um, at 8,000 feet is um, pretty unusual. So we've been getting some hail off and on all day. It's supposed to turn into snow tonight and then winter has started and the mountain will open and it'll be um, it'll be winter. I hope everyone's well. I just wanted to get on because it has been a couple of weeks and really um, the only update I have is just being back to work and just being <sighs> patient with yourself. So right now um, I only work, I only take two uh, clients per day. So I only work maybe between two hours, three at the most, with cleanup and breakdown and setup and all that. Maybe I'll work four hours. Uh, it's not a big day. But it's interesting how psychologically it's been good for me, um, but it's also been a little bit trying. And I haven't worked really I mean, I've worked very, very little since June of this year. And so, you know, other than COVID for the, you know, 18 months before that, um, I didn't work. I worked very, 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 very little. Um, but I was in a different frame of mind. It was like I was stressed about COVID and, and stressed about, you know, the state of the world and and when I was going to be able to open and was it going to get closed down again and, and everything. Um, for what I do is very, very close contact. And so COVID, um, obviously one of what I do for a living was one of the first to go. It's not something I can do over Zoom. And so I didn't work for that. And then I was going to come back to work and really just have a busy summer and then um, cancer happened and, you know, bowel obstruction happened and, and then I was able to come back a little bit, not enough, you know, I would schedule appointments, I would schedule sessions and I'd end up having to cancel last minute because I would wake up and I would just be in pain. I'd be really, really uncomfortable and most times I would end up back in the ER. I was in the ER, like I said, at least once a week, sometimes back-to-back -back days. Um, but what I wanted to talk about today is stress and the subtle effect that it's had on me for, well, probably since I was about 10 years old. And I think for most of us, we have this point where adulthood kind of kicks in and, and we start to worry about things, you know, whether it's something that we see on, I think for me it was like the watching too much TV or watching news, even though we weren't, I wouldn't say we weren't allowed to watch TV, but we had better things to do when I was growing up than to watch TV. Um, but every once in a while I would hear a story um, or Y2K, you know, happened when I was young-ish and the state of the world, like I would listen to the people around me, or I started listening to the people around me when I was about 10, 11, 12 years old. That's when I really started to observe life around me, and that's when stress became a thing. And I think I've been under tremendous stress. <laughs> Makes me want to cry thinking about it. But I think I've been under tremendous stress since I've been about 10 years old. And fortunately for me, it's my natural constitution to be a fairly laid back, grounded, mellow person. And I always observed myself being the sort of quiet, 
type or the quiet person or the, the person who never really got riled up. Things didn't affect me much um, outwardly. Um, but I was also affected with this sort of perfectionism. And if you have ever had perfectionism be a part of your uh, personality trait, you don't let people see you get upset. You don't let, you don't lose control. You don't want someone to see you unraveled or broken down. Um, it, it smashes this perfection facade that you're putting up. And without even really knowing it, that has been so ingrained in me. And I'm not, I would say there's a, there's a part of my perfectionism that I really enjoy. You know, I like to make things better. I like to see things and say, ooh, this can be done just a little bit better. I like to improve on things. And I don't know why every time I do a video, Buddha <laughs> starts to chew on his bone behind me, so I apologize. There's wind and rain on the outside, and Buddha's uh, happily chewing on a rawhide behind me. Um, uh, now, I'm not outwardly neurotic perfectionism. If you're a perfectionist and you get to know me, then obviously you'll pick up on the signs because you know it. And I've had friends pick up on that. And I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. I thought, what, what's wrong with wanting things to be a certain way? And that's true. That's absolutely true. And I think that's what makes people successful. That makes, you know, you, you know, ha happy in, in whatever endeavor it is that you feel passionate about, you know, being, excelling in that. You know, there's a certain level of perfectionism that does serve you very, very well. The other side of that is the tremendous amount of stress that comes along with that, that you don't even know is stress. It feels so natural and so normal to you, you don't know it's stress. The other part of that is ignoring your own self, uh, your body, ignoring your body signals, ignoring your gut feelings, ignoring your, your, your better judgment. N n so, so much, so not wanting to break the facade of who you are, you end up putting up with a lot. And I put up with a lot. And I learned, he's really going to town, Buddha. He's so focused. Anyways, um, you know, if you're uh, learning perfectionism and, and how to manage stress at 10 years old, you don't necessarily have maybe a good role model, or maybe this is your role model. Maybe you know, the perfectionism that we grew up with in our parents, um, or our parents not wanting to be seen weak, you know, we, we pick up on that. And when I was first diagnosed with colon cancer, I knew exactly why I had it. And, you know, obviously I, I don't know because I can't look inside my body and say, oh, this is exactly what happened. But I'm in touch enough with my gut now to know that this is stress and we blame a lot of on stress and stress has become sort of this you know oh if something's wrong it's just stress and we kind of write it off and we write it off as being a normal and natural thing and in some ways it is and in some ways stress also helps you grow it helps you adapt it um, can cause a friction in your life that will sort of you know, cause growth and strength within you, within your character. Um, but there's a, there's a sort of systemic stress that if you feel too much or if you, ob if the things that you observe in your life don't match what you're feeling, 
there's a stress there that's different than having to pay your bills or wondering what people think of you or or wondering you know who you are as a human being like that you know the existential stress that kind of stuff um stuff that you know every human being goes through there's a there's a different kind of stress that happens in people who are very very sensitive and I used to wear my em- empathy and my sensitivity as a badge of honor that, oh, I'm an empath, I have this special power. And I agree it is it is a special power, but I don't see it as being like a badge of honor. It's not this being able to feel a, a lot, being able to observe um, and sometimes if we don't get enough information in life, we start to come to conclusions about life around us and about people around us. Um, and it becomes dysfunctional. And I think that there's a part of empathy that is very dysfunctional. And it's the people pleasing. It's the, the person who feels too much. And so they go into workaholism or alcohol, you know, use we used to call it alcoholism, I think we call it alcohol use disorder now. Any kind of addiction, whether it's an addiction to perfection, an addiction to, um, to anything to, to make you feel differently than how you actually feel. Anytime I see anyone who's dealing with, with alcohol or drugs or perfection or workaholic or food or any of that, any of that I have zero judgment I have zero judgment and I think sometimes we get this message and it's sort of okay to say that hey people are shitty and and um, you know people are flawed and that people are imperfect and this world is a tough place to be and that people are mean and that, that this kind of stuff and I don't think that that's actually true. I think actually people, most people overfeel. And it causes, it can be too much. Being a human being can be a lot. And it's not if you're an empath or not, or if you're Um, come from a great family or if you come from a crappy family um, that usually meant well even that crappy family meant well being a human is intense (laughs) it really is intense and I remember as a kid you know maybe in like my early teens thinking how I wished that I'd didn't have the feelings that I did. I wished I could be a mean person. I wished that I could be callous or that I could be cold or that I could be heartless. Um, I always had this sort of like, when I grow up, I want to be um, a ruler of a kingdom, you know, like obviously, you know, fed to me by fairy tales and whatnot. Like I just wanted to be this heartless queen. And I think that is so that we don't have to feel the intenseness of being alive. Now, the other side of that is that you have you, that is your soul and however you define it, your spirit, your essence, your you, whatever it is inside this body, that is you. So you have to take care of that. There's this you that you have to take care of. And then you also have to take care of this body that you're toting around with you. and. The wonderful thing about this body is that it does not lie to you. It doesn't lie and it doesn't forget. It doesn't forget anything that's bad that's ever happened to you and it doesn't forget anything that's wonderful that's ever happened to you. Um, You know, I can can remember at at the drop of a hat who, who in my life has given me the best hugs because that's important to me. I know people's touch. I know people's words, people's tones of voices, those things that, that about people that are really, really wonderful. 
my body remembers that. And when I see them or when I think about them, I, that's the impact that it has on me because that was that important to me. And so this body, now I've been in the health industry for 22 years now and know the language of the body extremely well. You know, not just in my own personal life, uh, sort of a, a way of survival and adaptation and, and a way of maneuvering within the world, but I also know the body. I know I've had my hands on 20,000 people. And the body doesn't forget. And the body... <laughs> Looking at my own body that I've ignored criticized at best, ignored at worst, and I'm, you know, in my mid-40s now, probably have told, probably have already said that, but the body doesn't forget, and I'll tell you what, your colon does not forget, and I'm not making any claims about what causes cancer, or I think it's different for every person but I think you know. And that's the thing that, that I've heard that's common. When people first hear their diagnosis of cancer, um, either they get a response of fear, they get a response of uh, sort of a numb, sort of denial, sort of disbelief, or they know in an instant. They know what it is. It's this thing that happens. Oh, there's Buddha. Hi, bud. Hi, sweetie. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I don't think he knows what he's doing. He's going to bed. Okay. Um, so my first in instinct, and I've mentioned this before, is I knew exactly what caused it. and and stress, and I, I wish we could come up with a different word other than just stress, because stress is just, it's, it's a meaningless word to people. It's, we have to find something else. I don't know, that'll be for a different video. But I knew that what I have gone through emotionally, mentally, and psychologically in my life was being recorded in my body. I knew that for a fact, and, and that's something that if you have any sort of spiritual beliefs whatsoever, or any sort of, or if you are connected with your spirituality in any way, whatever that is for you, um, you know that, um, that the body reflects or manifests or keeps record or is listening. If anything else, your body is always, always listening. And I knew I had been asking, I had been praying for healing, for my body to be healed. My body hasn't been well for about five or six years. And it's manifested in different ways. Initially, it was an autoimmune condition that resolved itself, um, fatigue, uh, just constant fatigue, lack of, you know, just not wanting to be in my body, um, not for any pain or anything, just, it just seemed too, it seemed too much. And so I would do things to sort of numb the feelings of being in my body by distraction and, and what else, relationships, you know, um, sometimes it's easier to you know, kind of project into someone else's reality or someone else's life than it is to be in your own. So sort of be distracted by someone else. And I think that happens a lot in, in couplehood. And so that was my real addiction. Um, I've had other addictions, but my real one was um, relationships. I, the feeling of aliveness that was different than the intensity of being in my my own body and so it got to the point where 
I didn't want to be in my body. And I knew that over the years, my body was recording everything that had happened to me. And some of it I processed, a lot of it. I would say 90% of you know what I've gone through in my life. I've worked really, really hard to process it in, in, in every way that was available to me, that, that was right for the time. Um, and I knew that when I asked for help from non-physical to be healed from the pain in my gut, there's part of me that thought, oh, this will just go away. The discomfort, the not being able to eat, the pain, the just, I knew that there was something wrong with my body. But instead, I was blessed with a cancer diagnosis. And that cancer diagnosis has taken me to places in myself that were blessed, that are blessed. You know, it's given me friends that I didn't know exi- I didn't. It's given me the kind of friends I didn't know existed. <laughs> the friends that you can call at 11 o'clock at night to take you to the ER and they'll wait for you. They'll wait with you. Uh, ones that text you several times a day to make sure that you're okay. Ones that know when you're not feeling good, even when you don't know that you're not feeling good. Um, but it's allowed me the physical opportunity to deal with things that have occurred in my life, things that I've witnessed or things that I've experienced. And I'm really, really grateful for that. And I know in videos in the past, I've said, cancer sucks. Cancer really, really sucks. And that's true. Cancer is also really, really beautiful. And that is true as well. And in these moments, when you get to reflect on it, this is a gift. And it's not anything to be afraid of. Dying isn't anything to be afraid of. I, I know that now. I don't want to, though. That's the thing is I just don't want to. I'm not afraid of it. I just don't want to. <laughs> like, you know, you don't think of yourself as like having a choice of when you die or when you don't. And maybe you don't have a choice when you pass away. Maybe you do. I believe that you do. And um, I'm not ready to go yet. And I know that my body is also listening to that as well. And that my body doesn't want to go anywhere. And that my body faithfully, loyally, every single step of the way has made sure that I'm still here right now today. And I've never looked at cancer as something that has gone wrong. I've always looked at it as something that just is. It's a, it's a, something that's happening right now and it's okay and if you're questioning whether you should be here or not you know that's something that some people have very very strong opinion of um it's not something you necessarily share with a lot of people but the one thing that cancer does do for you one of its gifts one of its many gifts is that it makes you decide whether you want to be here or not if you if there's a part of you that does not want to be here you won't make it if in your soul you do want to be here, you will make it. And I'm not saying make it forever. I'm not saying make it till 95 or 98 or 105. But it's a choice. Living your life isn't just about the amount of time that you have on this planet. Living your life is that choice that you make. And you make it 
you when you learn that you have cancer. And then after that, you make it every day. You make that choice every day. And you choose to live. Now, it might be for your life circumstances, for things beyond anything that I could ever have an answer to, you might only be here for another nine months. But if you receive the gift that cancer has given you, you will live every day of those nine months. Or maybe you have not lived every day of your last four decades that you've been here. So even though cancer might take me out, I don't know. I really don't know. I don't want to. And since being diagnosed with cancer, that's now part of my vernacular is I don't want to, I don't want to die. I want to stay here. I want to stay here for as long as I can. That wasn't a question before. That wasn't something I ever got to even talk about before because we don't talk about this stuff. We don't talk about this choice that we have. And you make this choice for yourself and it's a beautiful choice. So whether I'm here for, you know, four months or another 40 years, I now know that I'm living with choice. And I'm a sovereign human being. And so much of what I thought was important to me has gone from my life. And in its place is all of these things that I didn't know were important to me. I didn't know it was important to have friends. I thought friends were scary. Our friends were there for convenience. Or friends weren't as important as your relationship, your partnership, your significant other, whatever that might be. I didn't know how important work was, life's work. And I wish we could call it something other than work. Um, I didn't know how important being pain-free having a body that works, being able to feel, being able to feel what my body feels. Even if my body's feeling in pain, I can feel it now. Whereas I couldn't feel my own body before. I could feel other people's bodies, I could feel other people's experiences, and I I think in some ways that's what saved me for so long. But now it's, it's me inhabiting my body fully. And if I get to do that, like I said, for another four months and that's it, that's amazing. If I get to do that for another 40 years, that's amazing. Another thing I've realized it's not as important as I originally thought is time. You know, everyone talks about being in the now. And so you do your meditations or you conceptualize it. And we all know what it feels like to be in that now space, in that flow space is another term that's commonly used. And I now know what that really, what that is. And I know what that is because... I now know what it feels like to run out of nows, to, 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 if I'm only here for four more months, that four months can be forever. I can make that four months last forever. And I know this because I've been here 40 plus years. And, God, I feel like I can't remember any of it. <laughs> so I, th- I think I'm going to leave that there for now. And thank you for, if you're still hanging on here 30 minutes later, thanks for hanging on. Uh, thanks for listening. If you have feedback, please leave it below. If you're going through something in your life right now, just remember that you have a choice. 
you always, 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 always have a choice. You have a choice about something and choosing for me, in my experience, being able to choose is an expression of who I truly am. It's one of the most important things to me. You know, going back to being perfectionism, um, you know, I lost uh, mm, the term control, control freak comes up with that as well. I have sort of a badge of pride. I'm such a control freak. Um, I don't... I wish... I don't know how to say this, actually. There's one part of being a control freak. But I don't think it's that for me. And maybe it's not for you. Maybe you've been called a control freak a perfectionist, whatever. But I've realized in these last four months, five months now, that it's my ability to choose that is the most important thing to me. And when you choose for yourself, when you choose yourself, when you choose how you want to live, and you choose how you want to die, and you choose takes care of you, what kind of care you receive, you choose which doctor you, you ha get to have care for you, you choose what you do for a living, you choose who your friends are, you choose what to eat, you choose how to dress yourself, you choose. It's so empowering, even if it's two shit choices, <laughs> and you get to choose. And if that makes me a perfectionist or controlling, then fine, but I don't think that it does. You know? You are a string of your choices. You are a collection of a gazillion choices you've made over your life. And respect that. Respect that about yourself. And honor yourself. So whatever you're going through right now, make a choice. Even if it's the smallest thing. Anyways, I'm going to leave it there. Um, going on 35 minutes here. And uh, I did go to work today, so I did my hair today. So i um, actually feeling good. I'm sporting the 40-something... Uh, turtleneck along with my big boots and being an adult and not being in a hospital gown today and still trying to figure out the ostomy bag this whole stoma thing is still working itself out that will be another video coming up um, just on that whole process so if you happen to be dealing with colon cancer this may be done in your future this might be something that you're dealing with you're not alone, um, but yeah, be nice to yourself. I'm gonna call it. Uh, I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna call it a night. All right. I hope you're well. Much love.